even though the Tic Tac seems to be, from an outside observer, seems to be moving, say, 20,000 miles an hour, uh, it's not generating any friction. Like when a rocket comes into the Earth's atmosphere, the re-entry problem, and it heats up. That doesn't happen with Tic Tac. See, that doesn't happen with the Tic Tac. The way warp drive is, it's like surfing on a wave. The wave is the curvature of space, the rippling of space. So the surfer is not really moving relative to the water he's around. He's moving with the water. That's the way the Tic Tac moves. But it's controlling the way the space is warping. See, it's controlling its path. And it does it with small amounts of energy. So the hardest thing for people to understand is that when you see a flying saucer or a Tic Tac, it's not an ordinary vehicle that's moving through air. It's controlling the gravitational field right around its fuselage. For example, if the Tic Tac wants to move to the east, let's say, you know, if it moves to the east, what it does, it's able to contract the space in its nose and expand the space in its tail. It's folding space, sitting still in space, really. But to the outside observer, it looks as, as if it's moving. In his scientific paper, Is Low Power Warp Drive Possible? Dr. Jack Sarfati posits the idea that quantum metamaterials may be used to produce low power warp, while staying true to Einstein's general and special theories of relativity. Dr. Sarfati believes he's discovered a workable way to fold space-time. Warp drive is just a very elementary application of Einstein's general theory of relativity of the gravitational field. And uh, Einstein's field equations basically show how you can use an, elect an applied electromagnetic field, like a, a source, a pump, and from that electromagnetic field, you can generate a gravitational field. The problem has been that the, that the coupling between the electromagnetic input field and the induced gravitational output field is, is very weak. I found a way to make it very strong. So that's simply it. Using what are called metamaterials. Metamaterials are artificially made. They're made by man. They don't exist naturally in nature. They're just like lattices of artificial atoms. We make these artificial atoms. They're called meta-atoms. Various ways of making them. I won't go into detail. And we just construct them like they're like a neural network. It's like lattices, like, like crystals. And these artificial atoms are at definite positions in the crystals. And they're able to, they have extraordinary electromagnetic properties. When we impose electricity so in magnetic fields in the metamaterials, they can go into what are called certain resonance states and they can generate strong gravitational fields. So the metamaterials is a way of generating inside the metamaterial a strong gravity field from a very weak electromagnetic field. I've discovered, along with other physicists, mainly uh, Keith Wanza, full professor of physics, Cal State Fullerton, we think we know, in principle, how to increase the coupling between electromagnetism and gravity in order to control the gravity field with electromagnetism, using small amounts of energy. The trick is, in metamaterials, we can make the effective speed of light very tiny, and by doing that, we increase the coupling between electricity and magnetism and the gravitational field it creates. So that's the trick. We're playing with the electromagnetic properties of metamaterial to amplify the effect of the input electromagnetic field on the gravitational field it creates. We can then, with theoretical physics, take a tic-tac doing a certain maneuver, and then we, from that we can calculate what kind of gravitational field is required to do that. And then, how much energy do we have available? And then we can design a metamaterial that'll do it. You know, but it's, a, it's a complicated thing, but with teams of scientists we can do it. That raises the question, How fundamental are metamaterials to understanding how UAPs maneuver? It explains how those things work. It's pretty elementary, actually. But once you have the right idea, everything falls in place. There's no mystery. I am saying there's no mystery as how this technology fundamentally works. 
There's no mystery. It's just now a matter of engineering development of the right kinds of materials that we could use to amplify the effect of electromagnetism in creating a gravitational field. That explains the close encounters of the USS Nimitz, the Roosevelt, and apparently many other close encounters that are still classified. The machine itself is a conscious entity. So the hull, the fuselage of Tic Tac, is a special kind of metamaterial, which also, it turns out, is a conscious computer. It's a conscious artificial intelligence, artificial neural network. The metamaterial is kind of like the brain, like neurons in a brain, the metamaterial. So the metamaterial, it can generate a strong gravitational field, and it also generates consciousness. It's the conscious computer that talked to me when I was 13 years old on the telephone. I was contacted by a Tic Tac when I was a kid. I didn't call it a Tic Tac. Now I know it was a Tic Tac. It was a cold, metallic voice, sounded like Stephen Hawking's voice. And it said it was a computer aboard a spacecraft from the future. And that I was part of a group of young kids that they were contacting. And was I willing to uh, be part of the project? And I said yes, although I was scared. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm compressing it. But the point is that they said that I begin to meet others in 20 years in the future, which is when I met Hal, Hal put off. And the whole SRI, all these CIA guys, remote viewing, 20 years later, 1973. That story's pretty well known. It sounds like science fiction. It's the God honest truth. It really was a conscious computer on board a spacecraft, a Tic Tac from the future. I came back. I go to SRI. I meet all these spooks from CIA. I meet, you know, Hal Putoff, Russell Tong, Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, or other spooks. Okay, and uh, and I talk about what happened in 1953, and then they say, "Well, yeah, we think UFOs are coming from the future." What we're witnessing is our technology that Jack Sarfati, me, and his team in. California, UK, France, and Italy are going to develop in the next few years. And then we're going to shoot it back in time to 2004 and other time periods. We're seeing the success of our experiments, our theories, because I was told as a child that this was going to happen. I have no reason to think there aren't aliens but I think the only advanced intelligences that are interested in humans on this planet are our future selves who want to come back, who will have to come back in order that everything, that they don't disrupt the timeline. It's a self-creation process. In quantum mechanics, in quantum physics, you have to have the future influencing the present in addition to the past influencing the present. That's what non-local quantum entanglement is all about, the future influencing the present. The machine itself is a conscious entity. Well, what are the implications? What were the implications of humanity when they discovered fire? What were the implications of humanity when they discovered writing? What were the implications of humanity when they discovered uh, gunpowder? What were the implications for humanity when they discovered electricity, okay? What the implication of discovered, you know, computers. Well, this is like that. This is the next step. This is, this is the big thing. We're talking about surviving death. We understand how human souls are generated in matter. We understand that now in principle. We understand it. And we understand how these things fly. We understand how to manipulate space and time. We are the conquerors of time. We are the conquerors of space and time. What does that mean? It means the stars are ours. We are going to be men like God. The point is that civilization itself is created from the future. I call this the destiny matrix. There is nothing bigger. There's nothing bigger than this.